So if we talk about a syndrome and, and the syndrome having a weight, the, the weight can be measured by, by the number of symptoms and the intensity uh, of each symptom. And, and so you can use a standard rating scale to basically estimate the severity that the person's suffering from. Now, obviously, some symptoms are more se severe and worrisome than others. Strong suicidal ideation, for example. Nevertheless, uh, the, the more symptoms, the stronger the symptoms, the more likely it is that the person's not functioning well. And, and so when you initiate a treatment, you want to have a baseline measure of the weight of the depressive syndrome. And, and then at key time points, ideally every other week, but even if that's not possible, monthly, uh, the same measure of the same signs and symptoms to see what progress has been made. Almost always you need to have about a 50% reduction in the weight of the symptoms in order to have the person declare that they are significantly better. A little better isn't good enough. Significantly better is a starting place because then you know you're on the right track with the treatment. And ideally you're aiming to help the person achieve what we call a remission, which basically means an almost complete reduction of the signs and symptoms of the depressive episode. I think when, when you're initiating a treatment, you want symptom relief to occur pretty quickly. Uh, but even before that, if the treatment's medication, you want to make sure that the treatment is reasonably well tolerated. So a first time-limited goal in, in a management plan would be to pick a medication that was affordable, uh, that could be taken without worrisome side effects or annoying side effects, and could start in motion the antidepressant treatment process. And so that's a goal for the first two weeks of treatment to accomplish those things. So that's a first time-limited goal. Uh, a second time-limited goal would be to get that first substantial symptom relief. And so let's aim to see that by four weeks. Ideally, we'd want to see it at two weeks if we could. Um, some treatments work a little faster than others, but generally, if you're not seeing that kind of reduction in the first four weeks, you may have to pick a different treatment for the depression. To, to get to the end of the acute phase of treatment, so that would be the third time-limited goal, that's generally between the sixth and twelfth week of treatment, and, and that's when you've declared victory with this particular treatment plan or turned to another treatment plan, treatment plan in which you're resetting your time-limited goals. There are all sorts of different guidelines to help physicians uh, um, stay on track with their treatment efforts, and there are guidelines for various different kinds of disorders. Uh, for the depressive disorders in the United States, the American Academy of Family Practice and the American Psychiatric Association have practice guidelines, as does the uh, uh, Veterans Affairs uh, medical system. So depending where you're practicing, there is a coherent set of guidelines that, that are available for you. I think the first American Psychiatric Practice Guidelines came in 1993. Um, I'm pretty sure they were revised again in about 2000. And I think the third edition came out in 2010. Uh, the third edition is the most recent one in part because the American Psychiatric Association has slowed down on guideline development and is still weighing the impact of, of their experts' relationships with the pharmaceutical industry. They're very, very concerned and, and cautious that, uh, that, that patients perceive that their treatment is being guided as much by experts' opinion as experts' relationship with, with pharmaceutical companies. So this is a controversial area. You, you can't have guidelines written by people who aren't expert, but if you limit the guidelines to only people who have no relationships with the pharmaceutical industry, you have few experts left to write the guidelines. So we've not come to a good piece with that. In Canada, they have. So my favorite current practice guideline is the one that our Canadian colleagues from their Mood Disorders Consortium does. There's a 2016 version that is almost perfectly well suited for American pract for practitioners in the United States. Of course, Canadians are Americans too. Uh, that, that are almost uh, uh, perfectly so well suited for us to use here in, in the U.S. 
So if we were going to take the Canadian guidelines uh, and, and then use them to update the, AP, the American Psychiatric Association practice guidelines, we'd, we'd have the newest antidepressants, uh, so medications like vortioxetine and, and uh, uh, velazodone would be added. Uh, the, the whole value of using newer generation antipsychotic medication uh, for adjunctive therapy of major depressive disorder, uh, that has mostly come online since the last edition of the American Psychiatric Association practice guideline. But even the Canadian guidelines don't have a, a full and up-to-date assessment of, of the newest therapies that have been introduced in the United States, and, and including Spravato, which is the intranasal form of esketamine, and, and, and then the uh, uh, newest medicine approved for postpartum depression, Brexanolone, which is a, a, a very, very interesting GABA-acting at a medicine called a, a neurosteroid, basically, which is another kind of rapid novel treatment for a condition that previously we had no specific medications indicated for.